Here we are again, a view from Mulberry Street. This is Matthew J. Mary, and um, today we're going to talk a little bit about Johnny Gotti, the famous John Gotti. We're not going to talk about his cases. We're not going to talk about uh, about the documentary history of John Gotti. Just a few tidbits about how I had the privilege of of knowing him personally, and uh, my impression of John Gotti, uh, which is pretty positive. And uh, <clears throat> just a few stories. You know, I had, I had heard of John Gotti long before I met him. Uh, he was, uh, he spent a lot, a good deal of his life prior to the time he became famous in jail. Uh, many, many state prisons uh, enjoyed the presence of John Gotti. And, uh, it seemed that every prison that he went to as a young man, uh, he pretty much had a habit of uh, taking control over it. Now, I don't mean that he ran the prison to the extent of telling the warden what to do or telling the, uh, the, the jailers what to do, but he was a leader in prison. And that's long before, very long before, Anybody heard of John Gotti in the newspapers? Long before any government agency accused him of being part of any organization, long before the media gave him any kind of title at all, uh, he was a famous guy in the streets as a street guy. Uh, and as I said, uh, I came to know about him when a young man, a friend of mine, was on his way to prison, uh, to Greenhaven Prison, and I, I asked a friend of mine, uh, do you know anyone there? And the person uh, told me, when, when your friend gets to Greenhaven, he's got to look up Johnny Gotti. And a lot of people misspelled his name. Uh, in fact, I misspelled his name uh, in my first letter to my friend who had arrived at Greenhaven. And I called him G-A-T-T-I instead of G-O-T-T-I. And when I got a letter back from my friend, <laughs> he said to me, he said, thank you very much for that introduction uh, to Johnny Gotti. He said, Johnny Gotti runs this prison, and I don't know if I'll be able to hang out with him because he runs a pretty tight ship, and I don't know if I could follow orders. Well, you know, you could take that any which way you want. But I took it in a very positive way because at that time, you know, I grew up in Little Italy and the Lower East Side, Nicaragua Village, and many friends and relatives had spent time in jail, time in jail. So, you know, growing up, I have to confess that I did have a lot of respect for people who knew how to do their time and to do their time well. And I'm not going to go into all of the people that I grew up uh, visiting in prison. But, you know, that, that was my introduction to, to Johnny Gotti. You know, Johnny Gotti, the jailhouse guy. And I'm going to get back to that at, at the end of this segment. Um, you know, uh, well, let me get, let me get to, to the point I want to make right now. Uh, at the end of his life, John Gotti, after defeating the government in three cases. They, the media called him the Teflon Don. The Teflon Don. We, you know, for some reason we can't beat him. Um, ultimately, you know, with the help of Sammy the Bull Gravano and some wiretaps uh, above the Ravenite Social Club, which we're going to talk about in a minute or two, uh, they were able to put John Gotti in jail for life. And unfortunately... During the course of, of, of Mr. Gotti's incarceration, he developed jaw cancer, cancer of the jaw. And let me tell you, you know, I talked to his lawyers about that situation when it was happening, meaning Bruce Cutler, Jerry Shawgill. And, uh, you know, I talked to doctors about it. Uh, the kind of cancer that John Gotti had, if he were on the street, would have easily been curable. I mean, without any question. But they let this guy, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, allowed this man, John Gotti, to languish in prison 
without doing any kind of test, without sending him out to a regular hospital, without sending him uh, even to a, a professional medical person who is an expert in the field. And so Johnny had a pain in his jaw, and what treatment did the government of the United States give him, the Bureau of Prisons? They gave him aspirin, and they told him, you know, that aspirin, aspirin's good for you. You know, aspirin, aspirin's all you need, John. There's no problem, you know, don't, don't make a big deal over this. And indeed, he did not. He did not make a big deal over that. And uh, ultimately, it became obvious that he was suffering from cancer. And, uh, and even when the government had to admit that, they did nothing to help him. Now, I know that attorneys who were associated with John Gotti wanted very, very much to bring a civil action against the government of the United States to try to force them to give him treatment uh, for cancer. And uh, I know for a fact that John directed his attorneys not to do that. And he just didn't want to give them the satisfaction of him begging for his life. He wasn't about to beg for his life. And he didn't. And so he died in jail. But, you know, this is the kind of thing, people dying in jail. I, I mean, I, I talked to you recently about Carmine Persico dying in jail for no reason, for no reason. We were in the court system for a couple of years talking about trying to, to get Carmine Persico home. And, and what do they do? They just sit on things and they wait for you to die. Oh, my goodness gracious. Is being accused of, of being part of organized crime... Does it always have to result in the death sentence in jail that you have to die in jail and they don't care about it and I wonder if they laugh about it? But this is a reoccurring problem. And so the idea, you know, John, my knowledge of John Gotti uh, started with knowing that he was a, a jailer. You know, what is a jailer? It's not someone who does his entire life in jail. It's someone who knows how to handle jail. So that was my introduction to John Gotti. That was the end of John Gotti's life, uh, being in jail, suffering from cancer, not being treated. Um, I first met John Gotti while I was visiting another inmate at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Manhattan. And uh, at that time, there was an attorney's room. And the attorney's room had several little office spaces, you know, several rooms. And at that point in time, all the rooms had a, had a clear uh, window from top to bottom so that you could see inside, you could see inside the room. And we lawyers who were visiting individuals we, who we represented, you know, we were allowed to talk to the other inmates and the other lawyers. It was like we walked around freely. That's not the case now nor has it been for many, many years, but way back, uh, I guess, in the 80s, that's the way it was. And anyhow, one day, I was waiting for the elevator to leave the attorney's room, and John Gotti uh, was also waiting for the elevator to go back upstairs to, you know, his assigned place. And um, we got caught in the count. What does it mean to get caught in the count? Uh, Every day in every prison in the United States, especially all the federal prisons, at least twice a day, they have what they call the count. And that means wherever you are as an inmate, you have to stand still, stop what you're doing, and just don't move. Just stay where you are. And they're going to count you, whether you're in your cell, whether you're in the cafeteria, whether you're at some kind of a, a program, uh, wherever you are, you stand still, that's where you are. And so John Gotti was stuck uh, in the, waiting for the elevator outside the attorney's room with me. And uh, there was an individual there by the name of Charlie Brody. Charlie Brody is a legendary character from my neighborhood. Uh, he, uh, his real name was Charles de Palermo. His brothers were Joseph de Palermo, also known as Joe Becky. Uh, his older brother was Pete P. 
P.D. Beck, also known as Peter D. Palermo, and uh, they came from Prince Street in Manhattan, uh, which is basically intersecting the Ravenite Social Club, which later became John Gotti's hangout. But anyhow, uh, Charlie Brody was uh, an older man and someone that, who was a friend of my family, and you know, uh, Charlie whispered in John's ear, and uh, next thing you know it, I'm shaking hands with John Gotti. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about you, and uh, my pleasure to meet you. Well, from that time, we were, we were stuck in the hallway for about 30 minutes, and we were talking about various cases, his case, uh, the case I was working on, other people's cases. He was very astute. Uh, uh, he, he understood uh, the legal system. Uh, he, he had a real good, raw uh, uh, intelligence concerning uh, the courthouse and what goes on there. And so throughout the next several months, uh, when I'd be visiting uh, my client in another case, I would always be talking to John. And, and it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to him. He always had something uh, smart to say, something to add to every conversation, and his demeanor was always that of a gentleman. I'm really talking about gentlemen. At least that's the way he was with me. Um, when he got out of prison one night, um, to be precise, approximately April 19th, April 20th, uh, 1987. My daughter was born on April 19th in Lenox Hill Hospital. And I had been up at the hospital for several days and uh, in and out. My wife, in those days, they allowed the, 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 the woman giving birth to stay in the hospital like for four days. And uh, so I was in and out of Lenox Hill Hospital. I went to dinner in a place called Il Gardinetto, which was a place frequented by John. And uh, I was kind of messed up. I, I had a beard and I, had, I was wearing a jogging suit, uh, pretty messy. And, and as I walked from my table, uh, I hadn't ordered dinner yet. As I walked from my table to the restroom, to the men's room, which was down the steps, uh, I caught John from the side of my eye. And he was sitting at a table with about 20 gentlemen and in full battle array. I mean, in splendor, dressed to the nines, and uh, you know, I I kind of turned away. I didn't want him to see me because I was such a mess. I didn't look very good that day. And uh, when I came up from the men's room, I kind of glanced over toward where John was <laughs> was sitting, and and there he was, with his finger, you know, like that, like beckoning me to come over. And, and so I did, and uh, it was kind of a funny. Uh, uh, situation, you know, I, I walked over and he said, hey, Matt, he said, you used to like to talk to me uh, when we were at the MCC. And uh, he said, now that I'm out, he said, well, why are you passing me up like that? Is something wrong? Did I do something to you? And, you know, of course, I, I laughed and I explained that, you know, I just didn't want to interrupt him. I, I saw that he was with his friends and, you know, everybody's all dressed up and having dinner. And so John invited me uh, to dinner, uh, and, and uh, I very respectfully kind of s squeezed my, my way out of that because I was meeting someone else, and, and I was waiting for that person to come. But, but I sat down with John and had a drink with him, and he admonished me. He said, don't ever do that again. Whenever you see me, make sure you come over to say hello. And so I did. Every time I did see him... Uh, at that, at that period of time, let's see, you know, my, my wife had lived on Lafayette Street around the corner from the uh, Ravenite Social Club. That was before, before we got married. So it was in, in uh, at that time, uh, I used to see John every once in a while in the club over there. And um, even afterwards, you know, during the time that the Ravenite Social Club became a major target of the United States of America. You know, I, I, I often would visit my in-laws who lived around the corner from the Ravenite Social Club. 
Anyhow, so let's let's get a little bit into the Ravenite Social Club. Uh, that was a club that had been uh, uh, on Mulberry Street, near the corner of Prince Street, for decades and decades and decades. I don't know how it started, uh, but I know for many years a, a, a person by the name of Anilio Della Croce was the uh, owner of that club. It was Anil's club. And Anilio Della Croce, of course, had a reputation with the government. The government said he was a very you know, important person in organized crime in what they call the Gambino family. They said Anilio Della Croce was the underboss of the, of the Gambino family. And, you know, I don't know what he was or what he wasn't, but I know he's a very distinguished man. Always, always dressed to kill. I mean, no, no pun intended. I mean, he was always dressed up, and he was so tall and so distinguished. And, you know, the first time I met him, you know, I'm kind of short. And so uh, Anilio de la Croce, like, look, look down upon me. And I was very impressed. I have to say, the only time I was uh, as impressed is when I met President Ronald Reagan and President Bush on separate occasions at the uh, Al Smith uh, Memorial Dinner. And uh, both of them, President Reagan and President Bush, were both very tall men and very kind of stiff. You know, they, they kind of looked down at you. And uh, that was Anilio de la Croce. He, he had a nickname. The media distorted his name, his first name of Anilio, which is an Italian name, to O'Neill, and they called him Mr. O'Neill. But most people just from the neighborhood, from Mulberry Street. If you came from Mulberry Street, you were able to say hello to Anilio de la Croce. And uh, uh, the media at some point had said that Mr. de la Croce was the mentor of John Gotti, and on and on and on. But at any point, when Mr. Delacroix passed away, I think that was December 2nd, 1985, Mr. Gotti kept that club open. And, uh, you know, he was there once or twice a week, and so were uh, hundreds of FBI agents. They bugged everything in the area. They bugged the parking meters, okay? They bugged the, uh, you know, you ever see the, 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 the traffic lights, they had they had cameras in traffic lights. You ever see the traffic lights that say walk and don't walk? Well, inside those ca those traffic lights were cameras focused on the on the Ravenite Social Club, and they had an apartment across the street from the Ravenite Social Club. And FBI agents were on different shifts, twenty four hours a day to observe the Ravenite Social Club. Okay? Ultimately, they rented, they were able to break into an apartment above the Ravenite Social Club, which apparently uh, John Gotti had access to. And that was a big part of their final case against uh, John Gotti. But uh, it was always amazing to me and, and certainly years later, I did a little documentary film, and uh, I was standing in front of the Ravenite Social Club, and I, I, I couldn't help but allude to the fact that while the government of the United States, year after year, was spending million after million, millions of dollars observing the Ravenite Social Club and walk talks, by the way, let me interrupt or interrupt myself. When people uh, de decide to take a walk and, and decide to talk while they're walking, they're just talking and they're walking. But when Italians decide to take a walk and to talk, that's what you call a walk talk in federal law enforcement uh, parlance. And they actually show films of people walking and talking, and they have witnesses who don't know, agents who don't know what the people are talking about, but yet this is brought into evidence at federal trials, case after case, over and over, about the walk talks. Oh, 
They're having a walk talk. So the presupposition is if you're Italian and you're walking and you're talking to another Italian, that means you're committing a crime. And believe me, believe me, that along with all the photographs of people paying their respects at wakes, uh, enjoying uh, weddings with people who are their friends, these things are used by the government in every case to try to deny bail to people, to say, oh, look, he was at the wake of so-and-so's wife. He was there. Oh, he was at the wedding of so-and-so's nephew. This proves he's a member of the mafia, and it, you know they're up to no good. They're doing something bad. Well, you know what they're doing? They're going to a wedding to celebrate a great event, or they're going to a wake or a funeral to, to pay their respects to people. But if you're Italian, if you're Italian-American, if the government thinks you're part of organized crime, that is actually evidence. And ladies and gentlemen, viewers, listeners, let me say to you, it's evidence. They use it as evidence with, with nothing more, nothing more. Here's a picture of him at the wake. Here's a picture of him at the wedding. Well, there were a lot of pictures taken of John Gotti, Sammy de Bulgravano, numerous, numerous people walking day after day up and down Mulberry Street, up and down Prince Street to the mailbox, to the mailbox over at Prince and Lafayette Street where my wife used to live before we got married. Oh boy, oh boy, I think now about all the millions of dollars spent conducting this surveillance. And at the very same time, folks, Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden was, was formulating the Al-Qaeda organization and planning the destruction of the United States and planning the 9-11 attacks. And what are the FBI doing? Are they investigating Osama bin Laden? No, they're investigating John Gotti at the Ravenite Social Club. Wow, it's kind of hard to believe. You know, for years, for years and years, and this is a fact, the government was always trying to link John Gotti to some union activity at the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers. And they were trying to say through the years, and never brought a case on this, that John Gotti uh, and, and other people associated with him ran the union that was in the, uh, the World Trade Center. And all this time that they were wasting trying to do that, to bring a case, Osama bin Laden, you know, as John, if it were true that John Gotti was involved with the World Trade Center, you might say John Gotti was interested in building the World Trade Center, right? They said, oh, oh, they control the construction industry. They control the construction industry. They control the unions. So they were saying John Gotti and his friends may have been responsible or played a part in building the World Trade Center. Meanwhile, Osama bin Laden is planning to destroy the World Trade Center, to kill thousands of Americans and the government of the United States don't even know who he is. And what do I mean by that? There were, there were Senate hearings way back when, when Al Gore, remember Al Gore? He was the vice president under uh, Bill Clinton. He ran for president against George W. Bush in, in, uh, in the year 2000 and almost made it, almost made it. When he was a senator, a United States senator, there was a hearing, and Colonel Oliver North was testifying at that hearing. And Al Gore asked Oliver North, who would you think is the most dangerous man in the world? And uh, because Oliver North had placed a, a very expensive security system around his home. And, uh, and he told the senators, including Al Gore, then Senator Al Gore, uh, the reason was that he... He feared for his life because of threats from terrorists around the world. And Al Gore said, well, who might you be afraid of? And, and, and Oliver North, Ali North said, I'm afraid of Osama bin Laden. And, and, and Senator Gore said, who, who's Osama bin Laden? He couldn't even pronounce his name. I mean, these, this is what our country was all about for a very long time. 
until we had to suffer the devastation of, of the, the bombing of, of, of the World Trade Center. Then the government woke up and the FBI started to, uh, to transfer personnel from the Ravenite Social Club to, you know, the Middle East. Anyhow, that was, the Ravenite Social Club had a, had a, a long, long history. Uh, uh, I, I told you in one of my previous broadcasts, I was down on Mulberry Street uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and, you know, the Ravenite Social Club, which was really an historical, uh, historical place, uh, they, they made a shoe store out of it first for, for yuppies. And the crazy thing about the shoe store is that there are only like four or five pairs of shoes in, in the whole store. I mean, what kind of shoe store is this? I kind of wondered if it was like an FBI front. But nobody's on Mulberry Street anymore. There's no one to investigate on Mulberry Street. Uh, luckily, there's still a, a, a lot of restaurants on Mulberry Street. But there aren't any more social clubs. Those days are long gone. And poor FBI guys, what do you have to do now? Now you have to investigate terrorists all over the world. And boy, this world is really a mess. Is There was a podcast by one of John Gotti's former colleagues, and that person in the podcast said that he became a cooperator, a government informer, because that person says John Gotti told him that he was going to have to take the fall for John Gotti in his last trial. And you know, my producers and partners on the show, you know, have warned me, like, listen, Matt, we don't want to have podcast wars. We don't want you attacking anyone else who's doing a podcast. Just tell your story. And, and so be it. Uh, I agree with that. And I have no, uh, I begrudge no one the right to tell their story, whether it's true, untrue, whether they're making mistakes or not. But when you tell me that John Gotti, the ultimate jailer, and let me interrupt myself. I'm not saying that John Gotti was perfect. Some of you out there must be scratching your head and saying, hey, Matt, don't you know John shouldn't have done this or he shouldn't have done that or he shouldn't have butt in to things that weren't his business? Yes, I understand all that. But all in all, John Gotti was a man. And John Gotti was a man's man. And John Gotti was a jailer. And the whole idea that John Gotti would order someone to take the rap for him just don't float. It don't float in any kind of river. It don't float in any kind of sewer. And uh, I just can't swallow that. Anyhow, uh, we're going to we're going to talk pretty soon. I don't know if we'll continue today or in another episode. We're going to talk about Tommy Karate, Tommy Patera, TK. He was my client, and um, Tommy, Tommy's case was the first federal death penalty case ever brought in the state of New York after that federal law was passed. And I was the chief counsel uh, to Tommy Karate. Uh, I just want to segue into Tommy Karate by saying that when Tommy was arrested, and he was arrested for numerous crimes that held a, a possible sentence of life without parole, he was, he was arrested for numerous crimes which held a possible sentence of the death penalty. He was arrested for nine murders. And when the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and the FBI arrested Tommy on June 3rd, 1990, they surrounded his car, they crashed his car, they pulled him out of his car, they put him in chains, not just handcuffs, behind his back. They put him handcuffs, handcuffs to his legs, leg irons, arm irons, and they beat the hell out of Tommy. They smashed his head repeatedly 
into his car. Tommy was a mass of blood. He later told the judge at his arraignment that he had fallen down. Anyhow, after the agents smashed Tommy's head to smithereens, they stood him up and they said, Tommy, we're investigating you for 37 murders. We have indicted you for nine murders. And they showed him a copy of the indictment. They said to him, we're on our way to court, but we don't have to go to court. We don't have to go anywhere. We could take these chains off you and cut you loose. And you see this indictment, it will go in the garbage and no one will ever know it existed. And all you have to do, Tommy, is give us one guy, John Gotti. Well, I don't want to tell you how Tommy reacted to that, but the agents didn't like it. They, they beat the heck out of him a little bit more. And Tommy wasn't going to lie about John Gotti or anyone else. Not to beat nine murder cases, not to beat a hundred murder cases. And so the story of Tommy Karate has been told a lot of times, but never told the right way. I think uh, when I talk about Tommy, what I need to do is to talk about Tommy Karate, the man. Tommy Patera, the man I knew. Tommy Patera, the man that I liked. And we'll be getting to Tommy Karate in short order. This is Matthew J. Mary, and this is The View from Mulberry Street. Yeah.